the reality of the soul is among the most important questions of life. Although religions go on and on about its existence, how do we know if souls really exist? A string of new scientific experiments helps answer this ancient spiritual question. The idea of the soul is bound up with the idea of a future life and our belief in a continued existence after death. It's said to be the ultimate animating principle by which we think and feel, but isn't dependent on the body. Many infer its existence without scientific analysis or reflection. Indeed, the mysteries of birth and death, the play of consciousness during dreams, or after a few martinis, and even the commonest mental operations, such as imagination and memory, suggest the existence of a vital life force, an elan vital, that exists independent of the body. Yet, the current scientific paradigm doesn't recognize this spiritual dimension of life. We're told we're just the activity of carbon and some proteins. We live a while and die. And the universe? It too has no meaning. It has all been worked out in the equations, no need for a soul. But biocentrism, a new theory of everything dash challenges this traditional, materialistic model of reality. In all directions, this outdated paradigm leads to insoluble enigmas, to ideas that are ultimately irrational. But knowledge is the prelude to wisdom, and soon our world of you will catch up with the facts. Of course, most spiritual people view the soul as emphatically more definitive than the scientific concept. It's considered the incorporeal essence of a person, and is said to be immortal and transcendent of material existence. But when scientists speak of the soul, if at all, it's usually in a materialistic context, or treated as a poetic synonym for the mind. Everything knowable about the soul can be learned by studying the functioning of the brain. In their view, neuroscience is the only branch of scientific study relevant to understanding the soul. Traditionally, science has dismissed the soul as an object of human belief, or reduced it to a psychological concept that shapes our cognition of the observable natural world. The terms life and death are thus nothing more than the common concepts of biological life and biological death. The animating principle is simply the laws of chemistry and physics. You, and all the poets and philosophers that ever lived, are just debris orbiting the core of the Milky Way galaxy. As I sit here in my office surrounded by piles of scientific books, I can't find a single reference to the soul, or any notion of an immaterial, eternal essence that occupies our being. Indeed, a soul has never been seen under an electron microscope, nor spun in the laboratory in a test tube or ultracentrifuge. According to these books, nothing appears to survive the human body after death. While neuroscience has made tremendous progress illuminating the functioning of the brain, why we have a subjective experience remains mysterious. The problem of the soul lies exactly here, in understanding the nature of the self, the I in existence that feels and experiences life. But this isn't just a problem for biology and cognitive science, but for the whole of Western natural philosophy itself. Our current worldview, the world of objectivity and naive realism, is beginning to show fatal cracks. Of course, this will not surprise many of the philosophers and other readers who, contemplating the works of men such as Plato, Socrates, and Kant, and of Buddha and other great spiritual teachers, kept wondering about the relationship between the universe and the mind of man. Recently, biocentrism and other scientific theories have also started to challenge the old physico-chemical paradigm, and to ask some of the difficult questions about life, is there a soul? Does anything endure ravages of time? Life and consciousness are central to this new view of being, reality and the cosmos. Although the current scientific paradigm is based on the belief that the world has an objective observer independent existence, real experiments suggest just the opposite. We think life is just the activity of atoms and particles, which spin around for a while and then dissipate into nothingness. But if you add life to the equation, you can explain some of the major puzzles of modern science, including the uncertainty principle, entanglement, and the fine-tuning of the laws that shape the universe. Consider the famous two-slit experiment. 
When you watch a particle go through the holes, it behaves like a bullet, passing through one slit or the other. But if no one observes the particle, it exhibits the behavior of a wave and can pass through both slits at the same time. This and other experiments tell us that unobserved particles exist only as waves of probability as the great Nobel laureate Max Born demonstrated in 1926. Their statistical predictions, nothing but a likely outcome. Until observed, they have no real existence. Only when the mind sets the scaffolding in place can they be thought of as having duration or a position in space. Experiments make it increasingly clear that even mere knowledge in the experimenter's mind is sufficient to convert possibility to reality. Many scientists dismiss the implications of these experiments, because until recently, this observer-dependent behavior was thought to be confined to the subatomic world. However, this is being challenged by researchers around the world. In fact, KHCO3 crystals were recently shown to exhibit entanglement ridges half an inch high. In 2013, the double slit experiment was successfully performed with molecules that each comprised 810 atoms. That year, a 5,000 atom molecule successfully displayed wave particle duality, demonstrating that quantum behavior could nudge far into the ordinary world of human scale objects. Indeed, researchers have now proposed an experiment to see if viruses can be used in these quantum experiments. Imagine the entanglement of living beings. Such experiments open up the possibility of testing the quantum nature of living organisms by creating quantum superposition states in the same spirit as the Schrodinger's cat paradigm. Importantly, this has a direct bearing on the question of whether humans and other living creatures have souls. As Kant pointed out over 200 years ago, everything we experience, including all the colors, sensations and objects we perceive, are nothing but representations in our mind. Space and time are simply the mind's tools for putting it all together. Now, to the amusement of idealists, scientists are beginning dimly to recognize that those rules make physical existence itself possible. Indeed. The experiments above suggest that objects only exist with real properties if they are observed. The results not only defy our classical intuition, but suggest that a part of the mind, the soul, is immortal and exists outside of space and time. The hope of another life wrote Will Durant gives us courage to meet our own death, and to bear with the death of our loved ones. We are twice armed if we fight with faith and we are thrice armed if we fight with science. Many of us fear death. We believe in death because we have been told we will die. We associate ourselves with the body, and we know that bodies die. But a new scientific theory suggests that death is not the terminal event we think. One well-known aspect of quantum physics is that certain observations cannot be predicted absolutely. Instead, there is a range of possible observations each with a different probability. One mainstream explanation, the many worlds interpretation, states that each of these possible observations corresponds to a different universe, the multiverse. A new scientific theory, called biocentrism, refines these ideas. There are an infinite number of universes, and everything that could possibly happen occurs in some universe. Death does not exist in any real sense in these scenarios. All possible universes exist simultaneously, regardless of what happens in any of them. Although individual bodies are destined to self-destruct, the alive feeling, the who am I question mark is just a 20 watt fountain of energy operating in the brain. But this energy doesn't go away at death. One of the surest axioms of science is that energy never dies, it can neither be created nor destroyed. But does this energy transcend from one world to the other? Consider an experiment that was recently published in the journal Science showing that scientists could retroactively change something that had happened in the past. Particles had to decide how to behave when they hit a beam splitter. Later on, the experimenter could turn a second switch on or off. It turns out that what the observer decided at that point, determined what the particle did in the past. Regardless of the choice you, the observer, make, it is you who will experience the outcomes that will result. 
the linkages between these various histories and universes transcend our ordinary classical ideas of space and time. Think of the 20 watts of energy as simply hollow projecting either this or that result onto a screen. Whether you turn the second beam splitter on or off, it's still the same battery or agent responsible for the projection. According to biocentrism, space and time are not the hard objects we think. Wave your hand through the air, if you take everything away, what's left? Nothing. The same thing applies for time. You can't see anything through the bone that surrounds your brain. Everything you see and experience right now is a whirl of information occurring in your mind. Space and time are simply the tools for putting everything together. Death does not exist in a timeless, spaceless world. In the end, even Einstein admitted, now Besso, an old friend, has departed from this strange world a little ahead of me. That means nothing. People like us don't know that the distinction between past, present, and future is only a stubbornly persistent illusion. Immortality doesn't mean a perpetual existence in time without end, but rather resides outside of time altogether. This was clear with the death of my sister Christine. After viewing her body at the hospital, I went out to speak with family members. Christine's husband, Ed, started to sob uncontrollably. For a few moments I felt like I was transcending the provincialism of time. I thought about the 20 watts of energy, and about experiments that show a single particle can pass through two holes at the same time. I could not dismiss the conclusion, Christine was both alive and dead, outside of time. Christine had had a hard life. She had finally found a man that she loved very much. My younger sister couldn't make it to her wedding because she had a card game that had been scheduled for several weeks. My mother also couldn't make the wedding due to an important engagement she had at the Elks Club. The wedding was one of the most important days in Christine's life. Since no one else from our side of the family showed, Christine asked me to walk her down the aisle to give her away. Soon after the wedding, Christine and Ed were driving to the dream house they had just bought when their car hit a patch of black ice. She was thrown from the car and landed in a banking of snow. Ed, she said I can't feel my leg. She never knew that her liver had been ripped in half and blood was rushing into her peritoneum. After the death of his son, Emerson wrote our life is not so much threatened as our perception. I grieve that grief can teach me nothing, nor carry me one step into real nature. Whether it's flipping the switch for the science experiment, or turning the driving wheel ever so slightly this way or that way on black ice, it's the 20 watts of energy that will experience the result. In some cases the car will swerve off the road, but in other cases the car will continue on its way to my sister's dream house. Christine had recently lost 100 pounds, and Ed had bought her a surprise pair of diamond earrings. It's going to be hard to wait, but I know Christine is going to look fabulous in them the next time I see her. Here we tell you what happens after you're dead. Seriously. Okay, it's not so serious, because you won't actually die. To lay the groundwork, let's recap the scientific view of death, essentially. You drop dead and that's the end of everything. This is the view favored by intellectuals who pride themselves on being stoic and realistic enough to avoid cowardly refuge in Karl Marx's spiritual opium dash the belief in an afterlife. This modern view is not a cheerful one. But our theory of the universe, called biocentrism, in which life and consciousness create the reality around them, has no space for death at all. To fully understand this, we need to go back to Albert Einstein's theory of relativity, one of the pillars of modern physics. An important consequence of his work is that the past, present and future are not absolutes, demolishing the idea of time as inviolable. If you try to get your hands on time, said the physicist Julian Barber, it's always slipping through your fingers. People are sure that it's there but they can't get hold of it. Now my feeling is that they can't get hold of it because it isn't there at all. He and many other physicists see each individual moment as a whole, complete and existing in its own right. We live in a succession of nows. 
We have the strong impression that, things, are their indefinite positions relative to each other, says Baba. But, there are nows, nothing more, nothing less. Indeed, Einstein's colleague, John Wheeler, who popularized the word black hole, also postulated that time is not a fundamental aspect of reality. In 2007, his delayed choice experiment showed that you could retroactively influence the past by altering a particle of light, called a photon, in the present. As light passed a fork in the experimental apparatus, it had to decide whether to behave like particles or waves. Later on, after the light had already passed the fork, a scientist could turn a switch on or off. What the scientist did at that moment retroactively determined what the particle actually did at the fork in the past. These and other experiments increasingly show that the flow of time is illusory. But how can we make sense of a world where time doesn't exist? And what does it tell us about death? Biocentrism sheds some light. Werner Heisenberg, the eminent Nobel physicist who pioneered quantum mechanics, once said, contemporary science, today more than at any previous time, has been forced by nature herself to pose again the question of the possibility of comprehending reality by mental processes. It turns out that everything we see and experience is a world of information occurring in our head. We are not just objects embedded in some external matrix ticking away out there. Rather, space and time are the tools our mind uses to put it all together. Of course, as you're reading this, you're experiencing a now. But consider, from your great-grandmother's perspective, your nows exist in her future and her great-grandmother's nows exist in her past. The words past and future are just ideas relative to each individual observer. So what happened to your great-grandmother after she died? To start with, since time doesn't exist, there is no after death, except the death of her physical body in your now. Since everything is just nows, there is no absolute space, time matrix for her energy to dissipate, it's simply impossible for her to have gone anywhere. Think of it like one of those old phonographs. The information on the record is turned into a three-dimensional reality that we can experience a moment at a time. All the other information on the record exists as potential. Any causal history leading up to the now being experienced can be thought of as the past, e. the songs that played before wherever the needle is, and any events that follow occur in the future. These parallel nows are said to be in superposition. Likewise, the before death state, including your current life with its memories, goes back into superposition, into the part of the record that represents just information. In short, death does not actually exist. Instead, at death, we reach the imagined border of ourselves, the wooded boundary where, in the old fairy tale, the fox and the hare say goodnight to each other. And if death and time are illusions, so too is the continuity and the connection of nows. Where, then, do we find ourselves? On rungs that can be shuffled and reshuffled anywhere, like those, as Ralph Waldo Emerson put it in 1842, that Hermes won with dice, of the moon, that Osiris might be born. Einstein knew this. In 1955, when his lifelong friend Michel Besso died, he wrote, now he has departed from this strange world a little ahead of me. That means nothing. People like us, who believe in physics, know that the distinction between past, present and future is only a stubbornly persistent illusion.